You're watching BCTV. We're all about Brantford. You're watching BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. This program is brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Town of Brantford Board Finance Meeting for Monday, March 21st, 2022. And first on the agenda is to approve the minutes of the February 28th, 2022 meeting. I read your own, I'll move it. Second, Joe. And move on second is discussion. All in favor? Aye. Second on the agenda is a presentation of Hooker and Holcomb on the pension and other post employment benefits evaluations. And with us we have Steve Levinsky. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. We're going to be uh, going over three plans tonight the uh, police pension plan, the volunteer fire plan, and the OPEB, which is also the retiree medical plan. Um, the most recent valuations on the pension side were 2021. The most recent OPEB valuation was 2020. These are done biennially. Um, the agenda on page two just has an overview of what I'll be talking about tonight. I'm going to go through a summary of the results since the last valuation. We'll go into the, a little bit of detail about the numbers. I'll keep it at a high level. And then um, at the end, I'll take any questions you might have about what I'm talking about tonight or about the reports. So page three, I'd like to give a little backdrop before we get into the valuations themselves, just to give some context of how they relate to the life cycle of the plan. And if you look at the box, kind of in the middle of the page, um, you say the town's ultimate cost over the life of the plan, meaning the amount of cash that goes into the plan, that's money in, uh, must equal money going out. So money going out being retiree benefits paid, any administrative expenses you're paying out, and of course, um, an important offset to that cost is investment earnings that you earn on the funds and any contributions the members are earning or are making. Um, the reason I start with that is because that's over the life of the plan. We're, the valuation is a snapshot in time um, every two years. And what it does is it says, okay, well, the cost of the plan, we know the cost of the plan or are predicting the cost of the plan over the lifetime. We have to budget a part of that to the current budget year. So that's what each of these valuations does, um, assigns a cost to the upcoming year. There's two pieces to that. Um, in the pension plans, the members are earning benefits as they accrue a year of service, as their pay goes up. Um, that's the current accrual known as the normal cost. And then to the extent that assets don't cover the liabilities of the plan as of the valuation date, that's called the unfunded liability. Um, sometimes I refer to that as the mortgage of the plan that mortgage gets paid off over time. And that period of time is down at the bottom. It varies depending on the plan, um, anywhere from 10 to 16 years for the two pension plans to 26 years for the OPEP plan. Okay, so with that as a backdrop, um, I'll go to page four, which is the police pension valuation. Again, just uh, summarizing the experience of the plan over the last two years. So the funded ratio of the plan, 100% um, would be, mean that assets exactly equal liabilities. That was 72.8% this time around versus 74.3%. So it's, it's slightly down from 2019. And I'll talk in a minute about the reasons for that. Um, the term ADEC, you'll see that a lot. We try to avoid acronyms, but ADEC is basically the town's contribution in terms of the budget impact actuarially determined employer contribution. So that that is up from last year. Uh, it was 1.19 million for fiscal 22. And this valuation produces a result of 1.42 million. So it, it is an increase. Uh, to the good, investment return on a market value basis over the last couple of years were excellent. Um, they averaged about 10.9% per year. You might recall that a smoothing technique is used for pension plans to smooth, smooth out the ups and downs of the market. So when the market goes down, um, you don't feel that in the budget number as much, if you will. But when the market goes up, um, like it did recently up through the end of June of 21, um, you see the benefit of that, but it, it, it's phased in. So there's kind of this ebb and flow over time. So 
taking that into account on a smooth basis as of the valuation date, it was about a 5.2% return. So we had some losses from prior years being phased in, which more than offset the gains. The plan did experience a liability gain. When we talk about gains, that means um, results were more favorable from the plan's perspective than we predicted actuarially. So actual return, retirement turnover patterns over the past couple of years um, resulted in liabilities that were a little bit less than we predicted. Um, the big change on the police plan was for mortality, for the, mainly for the mortality table, and I'll, I'll get into the details in a moment, but that mortality table change increased the contribution by 225000 So absent that change, the contribution would have been about the same. That was really the big driver. Um, and the last bullet point on this page, I just put this as a point of information. Um, there's no magic to that percentage. It just, a, a percentage in the high 50s, 60% just indicates a plan that's very mature. Um, it's been around a while. So that's, that's just a point of information. Page five, uh, get into the details a little bit. Um, the first bullet point is the mortality table. So the the group that governs the work that we do is called the Society of Actuaries, and periodically they do studies of things like mortality, how long are people living. Um, believe it or not, there had never been a study done prior to 2019 that studied strictly public sector pension or mortality. So this is the first of its kind. Um, that study showed that public sector employees actually live longer than the previous tables predicted. Okay, so that's, that's a good thing, but when we map that over to the pension plan in terms of the liabilities, people are expected to live longer and the liabilities go up. Um, so we picked that table up for this valuation um, and that, in terms of the percentage increase in the liability, it was about a 5% increase, but as I talked about a moment ago, when you translate that to the contribution, it was about 225,000. Uh, the second one, and again, this, this valuation was completed a few months ago. Um, it's a bit counterintuitive because the inflation assumption was reduced slightly, but you have to remember that these are ultra long-term assumptions over multiple decades in the future. So even though inflation, as we all know, in the short term has been running very high, the current uh, look of Social Security is slight, was slightly less than what the current assumption was. Not, not a big difference, 2.4 versus 2.5. Of course, that will be monitored over time as, the, as those trustee reports come out. Okay. That was a very minor impact on the valuation. Um, page six gets into the numbers a little bit. It's the executive summary from the report. And um, there's two columns. The, the column on the left is the current valuation. The column on the right is the prior valuation. So up top, you can see that the membership um, Slight increase in membership counts versus 2019. A couple more active members, for example, from 46 to 48. A few more retirees from 49 to 52. So slightly larger population. Um, going down to kind of the middle of the page, the two key numbers in terms of the funded ratio, if you see actuarial accrued liability, about 38.6 million. So that's accrued. That's liability accrued to date through the valuation date. And that's measured against the plan assets on the actuarial value, which is the smooth value that I was talking about. <coughs> that was 28.1 million on that date. So when we look at that relationship, that's the unfunded liability that I mentioned earlier, 10.5 million being paid off over time. And the funded ratio is just the ratio of those two numbers. So 72.8% 72, 72 of the liability is being covered by the assets. And when we translate these results to a contribution, as I mentioned, the ADEC is the town's contribution. So for fiscal 23, you can see the number, you know, down to the dollar, what I mentioned on the previous slide, 1.425 million approximately. Any questions on the police plan before I go with the other plan, because I'm using a similar format for the other two. Any questions from the board on presentation? So 
move on to the volunteer fire in similar format on page seven overview of results. So this plan, uh, different snapshot date. The, the prior one was July 1st, 21. This plan uses a January 1st snapshot date. The funded ratio for this plan increased from 79.5 to 90.5 percent. The town's contribution or the ADAC actually went down from 66,000 to 51,000 for fiscal uh, 23. Similar to the police plan, the investment returns on a market, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a market value basis were excellent. They were well above the assumption at 12.2 percent, but for the same reasons, the smooth value came in at 5.6 percent per year. Over time, those gains will get phased in. We'll see, we'll see some convergence and reflection in the asset return. Um, on the liability side, the plan had a gain, again, more favorable from the plan's perspective. Um, mortality was a little bit higher than expected amongst retirees, so that dropped the liability a bit. And expected accruals by active members were a little, little lower than expected. Remember, this, this plan uses a points-based system. Um, the members have to earn a certain number of points every year to accrue service, so to the extent they don't do that, um, that's a gain to the plan. Similar change to um, as the police plan, but this, this plan is much smaller, a different population. Really, the impact was minimal, um, only at $800, and it actually reduced the ADEC by about $800 for this plan. And um, demographics much different. Um, a lot of active members relative to retirees in the volunteer plan, so only about 18% of the liability is due to the, due to the retirees. Um, I've already talked Steve, about. Can I ask a question? Sure. Well, why again did the increase? Was there an increase in the in the police mm -hmm. and not in the fire? Um, because we do we look at the populations um, specifically, and without going too far in the weeds on these studies, um, the studies look at both the type of occupation. So in this case, it's both public safety, but it also looks at things like the benefit levels that are provided to the members and makes um, adjustments to the mortality based on those benefit levels. And because the benefit levels so of the police... So it's really the fringe benefits? Well, the, be the pension benefits yes. in this case. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, so it has it has a much more, um, say, powerful impact on liability for the police versus the fire. Okay. We've already talked about the items on page 8, so I'm not going to reiterate it's similar similar changes as the police. Um, page nine, again, the executive summary. So you can see what I was mentioning earlier. Um, for example, 2021, there are 223 active members, volunteer fire fighters, uh, versus only 14 retirees. Okay. Um, accrued liability in the middle of the page, roughly 1.5 million versus 1.4 million in assets. Okay, so assets cover 90.5% of the liability of this plan, okay, which, reduced, which resulted in a reduction in the town's contribution for the upcoming year. Okay, any other questions on the uh, volunteer fire pension actuarial overview? So the last plan uh, that I'm going to talk about tonight is the OPEB valuation, AKA the retiree medical plan. Um, big changes here in terms of the results and the funded ratio and the contribution, and I'll go through that in detail. Um, funded ratio as of, this is July 120, it's actually, assets actually more than cover the accrued liability of the plan. So assets cover 123% of the plan's accrued liability versus 59 56.9% in 2018. Um, and you can see the impact on the, on the contribution for the town of the ADEC went from 2 million for fiscal 21 to all the way down to 300,000 for, for the current fiscal year. So there, there are some different reasons for that. Um, asset returns were re basically right on the money relative to the assumption. The assumption is six and a half and that's what this fund earned, so that really wasn't who was driving this. Um, you might recall that addition, the town made an additional cash contribution of about seven and a half million dollars into the plan. So that was a that was a big 
number and it's going to close and then I'm fund a liability back in fiscal 20. So that was one, one piece of it. The, the plan itself um, on, the, on the liability side, the premiums, we make, we make assumptions about how fast the premiums go up, medical costs and things like that. There were um, savings there. In other words, those increases did not go up as fast as we expected. So those liabilities came in lower than expected for this valuation. There's something called the Cadillac tax. I don't know. I don't know if you've heard of that or remember that, but that was a 40% excise tax that was scheduled to kick in. Um, that was repealed back in December 2019, and it had a modest impact, but nevertheless, it had an impact because that that was sort of baked into our future um, trend assumptions. So that that came out. So just to kind of set the table here before we talk about some of these other changes that I'm going to go over in a minute. Um, prior to the assumption changes I'm going to talk about shortly, um, on a baseline, you know, taking into account the investment return, the additional cash contribution, the um, favorable premium increases, the funded ratio of the plan would have been roughly 109.6%. Okay, so still a big change, a big, you know, big increase versus last time, but not the whole story. So the rest of the story is, of course, mortality, um, similar to the pension plan, that did serve to partially offset some of these savings because people are expected to live longer. So that did increase the liability by about 2.8%. Um, the, one, the one big driver here, um, when OPEB plans were really first starting to be measured in the GASB maybe a decade ago, maybe a little longer than that, um, there wasn't a lot of good plan experience out there because the liabilities hadn't been measured. So it was really time, I felt, to take a deep dive in the plan experience relative to what's been happening, relative to the assumptions. So we looked at a number of things. We looked at spousal coverage. We looked at members when they when they get to retirement. You know, do they elect OPEB? Because unlike pension plans, um, you know, everybody everybody elects their pension plan when they're eligible, but OPEB plans, because they involve cost sharing, retirees have to contribute either a portion or all the premium. Um, there's a decision to maybe be made, and you know, enough of the time, um, they, they elect not to have coverage for whatever reason. They may have coverage elsewhere, they might be covered by a spouse, you know, there are a variety of reasons. So we looked at, we looked at that, we looked at healthcare trend, um, there were new retirement and turnover assumptions at the state level um, for the Teachers Retirement Board and MERS. Um, so, you know, OPEB covers teachers, so we map those over here. Those also generally reduce liability. So everything kind of worked together for this valuation, and it reduced the liability by over 13% in terms of these assumptions and reduced the town's contribution by about $679,000. Okay, so big change there. Um, this plan historically has not used asset smoothing, but in talking with the town, we believe it's, um, it's prudent at this time, at least prospectively, to adopt it. There's no impact on this valuation because we didn't smooth anything, so everything's me measured on market. Page 11, um, executive summary in similar format, 2020 versus 2018. Um, this cover, <clears throat> excuse me, this plan covers 575 active members, which is, which is down slightly from 2018, 586, and retirees are up slightly from 79 to 86. So total membership is about the same. Um, you can see in the middle of the page, again, the actuarial accrued liability, 25.9 million approximately as of the valuation date versus assets of 31.9. So. And in parentheses, the unfunded liability means there's a surplus. So that doesn't mean that um, the town never has to make a contribution again in the future. It just means that accrued today assets more than cover what's been earned. Okay, so that results in the contribution you see at the bottom, roughly 300,000, um, a significant decline versus fiscal 21. Um, in closing, just looking ahead, and we, we do this routinely um, by having on the page, I'm not trying to imply that there's 
that the six and a half percent is not appropriate. It's just something we continue to monitor every valuation as uh, things like inflation change and views of the world on asset returns and so forth change. It's just something we look at routinely and, and uh, kind of analyzing the valuation assumptions. So that's that's my formal presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Steve. So you're still recommending the 6.5 percent assumption for these valuations? Yes, we we maintain that um, in consulting with the town. Questions from the board? Aaron? Yeah. Uh, assuming you do well, and you stay with the 6.5. Uh, if it starts to dip, meaning to four, what? What are you going to readjust? Uh, we, we readjust things um, on the valuation snapshot dates. So for the police and fire, um, the, next, the next police valuation will be July 1, 23. The next fire valuation will be January 1, 23. Um, OPEB, will, actually that's coming up very quickly in only three months. So that will be July 1, 22. That'll be, so that will be the first valuation where we really take um, another, another another look at, at six and a half. Charlie. Steve, do we have a target percentage for each one of the plans? As far as uh, uh, fund funding it? Yeah, all, right. So all the, uh, that's that's a very good question. Um, all the, un under the actuarial methods and assumptions, they're all designed to drive the funded percentage towards 100% over time. Because that, you want to get your assets to be ideally exactly in balance with the liabilities. So the two pension plans right now are below that. And so the contributions over time are designed to get to up to 100%. The OPEB is more than 100% right now. So kind of take the foot off the gas a little bit um, and, and drive it back down towards 100%. Okay, and you only do the evaluation once a year? Um, every other year. Every other yeah, year? Yeah, biennial. Yeah, so we develop, uh, each valuation develops contributions for the next two budget years. Okay, other questions? Um, Jim, comments? Yeah, just, just one thing uh, related to the 6.5% uh, return assumption. As Steve pointed out, uh, we do have conversations on that. Uh, this board has in the past uh, lowered uh, those numbers and in looking at this year uh, you know in the whole when you look at all of our pension costs combined uh, and OPEP you know while OPEP certainly had some good numbers uh, if we had uh, lowered the percentage those those contributions would go up but the changes in the police that he talked about with the mortality tables and some of the other changes would have driven that contribution higher the other thing we are also aware of is the fact that we're still phasing in the CMERS, so, uh, which is a state plan, uh, those increases which are being phased in over time. And, you know, we have taken steps, this board and the RTM, over the years, uh, in, in effect offset that a little bit by improving our uh, ratios at times by augmenting and putting additional dollars in, into the plans. Uh, you know, when we have opportunities to. So, you know, we're, look, we're constantly looking at these things when we do the valuations, but given the other uh, pension OPEB drivers, uh, some good, some bad, uh, we decided to essentially uh, keep it at 6.5%. Uh, and we didn't feel it was a number that uh, one would, that folks would feel is unreasonable. And, and, you know, the other folks that look at this is you know the bond rating agency so so they look at your liabilities and they can apply their own discount factors i believe in the private sector they use treasury rates to discount uh, private sector plans uh so you know there's other things that uh, that they can uh, look at the auditors when the liability is is booked uh, and the audit report if we were using a uh, i'll just use a ridiculous example a nine percent return assumption and all of our money was in cash and our liability is blank on the balance sheet, the auditors would obviously have, have an issue with that to use an extreme case. So a lot of factors uh, go into that, and, and we do look at them, and we do make uh, adjustments either on the assumption side, on the funding side, uh, and, and we've done that uh, throughout the last decade or so, or more, actually. So. Thank you. 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 Th
Thanks, Jim. What percentage do you know that is the state using? The state is using 6.9. 6 6.9 percent? Right. The state was considerably higher than that. Right. Uh, so when folks, when it dropped to 6.9, I remember uh, CCM asked if I would speak against them lowering the return <laughs> assumptions, and I couldn't do it in good conscience because we were six and a half. <laughs> Yes, good for you. So. And so we, you incorporated the million four twenty four nine sixty in the budget proposal for this year. Um, again, down from the million six forty, just for the reference. So conceivably, if, if we're at seventy two percent, we dropped two percent since the last email. The board could consider at some point increasing the contribution in order to, knowing that there's going to be a, a study this this July. That's for another conversation. Um, other questions or comments? I think we're good. So, Steve, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Number three on the agenda is to continue the budget hearing, public hearing process that we have for the our annual budget process. And before we get started tonight, I just want to recap again the, the highlights of the budget requests that have been put in front of us. And um, so the total request for, for the annual for this budget is $127,024,327. And there's an estimated revenue of fourteen million five hundred ninety thousand, which would leave one hundred twelve million four hundred thirty-three thousand to be raised from taxation. That's a five percent increase in requested expenditures. And for right now, we have an estimated grant list of three point eight one zero billion dollars, and that's an increase of one hundred seventeen thousand in grand list assessments. That equates right now at a mill rate of 30.25 or eight tenths of a mill increase as these budgets are proposed. So as I mentioned previously, this will be, this will be the last night of our public hearings. The board will meet again next Monday to our budget workshop to essentially cut the budget and recommend a budget to the RTM. They will continue with their with their process, which includes committee hearings and the full RTM, meeting sometime in the late April or early May. The budget will come back to us for finalization of the revenues and setting the bill. So with that, we will move on to the first presenters, which is Christine and Hamlet with regards to the Shoreland Adult Education. Thank Hello. you, Mr. Mooney. And I want to turn it over to Christine very quickly, just to, as she uh, talks about the... Page 62 for the board members. She talks about the enrichment portion of the adult ed. And, um, and I also just want to comment on the wonderful work that she's been doing. Uh, we went to a new model relative to, we used to have an administrator dedicated uh, to doing um, the oversight of the program. And we now have a management team, and Christine has been part of that, and she's been instrumental. Uh, so I turn it over to Christine. Thank you. So when I was here last year and we were talking about the budget um, for this year, we knew that we were setting a very optimistic budget with that $76,600. As you can imagine, we still felt the effects of COVID, so we didn't quite get there. Um, but we are self-funded, so when our revenues are lower, so are our expenses. But we're very excited to report that we were able to offer um, 60 additional classes over last year. Our enrollment was up 117% and our revenues are up 165% this year. So we are definitely moving in the right direction. Um, for next year, we are still optimistic, but setting maybe a little bit more realistic budget. So we lowered it just by $5,000, um, but you can see that some of the expense lines have been lowered to reflect that. Um, but we also added some money into certain lines. This year, we've had enrichment classes in multiple locations, so we realized, well, we need to account for mileage for our enrichment coordinator. Um, we also added money to office supplies and miscellaneous for next year. Again, 
hoping that COVID is really more behind us for next year. Some of our profits go to um, supporting some of our mandated programs. We have a wonderful ESOL family literacy program and we like to have family activities with that. Like we had a math night one year and a bingo night. So we like to use some of our profits to be able to have prizes and refreshments. Also our um, diploma graduation, we like to have some refreshments too. So. So that is our budget for next year. Uh, thank you uh, for that budget uh, presentation. And questions from the board? Questions from the board? Questions from RTM members or members of the public? So this request is for $71,600. And as Christine uh, presented, this is a self-balancing budget. So, um, with that, Christine, you're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Okay, next is school age child care on page 63. Faces, uh, Joe, as you can tell, uh, for last year um, we had Michelle here. Michelle has uh, taken, um, she, uh, she actually resigned. I believe she's taken a different position, but I'm not quite sure where. Charles Ciccarella is our director of um, student services, and he has oversight of the FRC program. And part of the FRC program is the school age child care. Uh, so that's kind of just the, for the benefit of everybody here, that's, that's the, the history as well as the organization. So with that, I turn it over to Charles. Thank you. Thank you for having us tonight. Uh, yeah, Family Resource Center is a strong component in the town. We offer a lot to the students, and a component of that is a school-age child care program. In order for us to get that FRC grant, school-age child care has to be a, a part of the services we offer. Um, with our new structure, uh, there's been a structural change. As Mr. Hernandez was talking to, because of the leadership change, uh, Ms. Cellini came on board and we started to really look closely at the programming in our school-age child care to try to see where is it that we can make refinements, enhancements, uh, remove things that aren't necessarily doing well, add to the things that are doing well so we have more momentum. So this budget really represents that kind of consolidation and that kind of analytical thinking. Kim is new to the role, I'm new to the role. We started really functionally less than a year ago in doing this, so it's been a year of really accounting for what's in place and what are the next evolutions that we want to put in place. So with that said, this is a self-balancing budget. It is paid and accounted for through tuitions. Uh, consequently, all these expenses that you see here are balanced out with uh, the tuition, the income that comes from the tuitions. We're looking at approximately uh, revenues of $373,460 for next year, that, that's, we're basing that on approximately 130 tuitions. And Kim, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure, so we looked at trending data of enrollment this year and also actuals that were presented in past trending years. So with that, we came up with a budget of $373,000, $460, sorry. And um, as Charles mentioned, the structural changes were um, allowed us to look at that in collaboration with our uh, financial department at the Board of Ed. So with those actuals, we came up with a budget that supported that with the tuition. So um, and this is based on 130. Yeah, we're based so, on so enrollment trends. We're looking at approximately 130 enrollment. students. And there's a variety of setups with that. Some students come just in the morning before school. Other students come just in the afternoons. Still others will go to both. And another cohort will just be a, uh, what they call a drop-off. A parent who's a part of the school-age child care, but they're not on a set schedule. And they'll call 48 hours or 24 hours in advance and say, tomorrow my child's going to be there. So there's all these different dynamics that we have to count for. Because within that, some students come two days a week, others come five. So there's a complex matrix that we try to account for in that 130 students. <clears throat> and this is in the old primary school? Indian Net. 
where the Neck office school. is housed at Indian Neck School, but our programming is set at the three elementary In schools. Right. Yeah, so it's it's housed before care there, and then they'll travel to their classroom after school, and then back again. Most of the um, facilities that's used is the cafeteria and the gym and the outdoor space. <coughs> And staffing is dependent on that enrollment. And, and we do work with kindergarten through grade six. That's the enrollment mm -hmm. cut points. And if there are well students, like they get bused and transported mm -hmm. to the elementary schools based on their program enrollment. Mm -hmm. and, and what you're seeing in the budget also includes, it's not the 180 days. It includes approximately 30 days for summer programs. Thank you, folks. Questions from the board? Yes. Uh, go Harry and then Sharon. Okay. Uh, under the tuitions, what, what are your sources, federal, state, private, pay? They're funding it through parent fees. Yep. Through what? Parent fees. Parent fees. So they pay a tuition to enroll their child in so staff. So it's private pay. It's private, private pay. pay. It's health pay. Yes. Yep. Yep. So what's the age of the kids that you age five through 12. Some Walsh students do decide to enroll because if they have younger siblings, as like a sixth grader might have a fourth grader, and they're not quite mature enough to stay home, so they utilize the before and after care. Okay, do you provide transportation to yes. the school? Yes. Okay. When you if pick them up at their student. homes? They would, if they are a wall student, then parents would drive them to one of the elementary schools, and from the elementary school, they would get transported to Walsh, or if they were oh, after okay. school, from I Walsh to the elementary. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Questions? Is the tuition based on per pupil, or is it a sliding scale based on the income of the family? It is based on the days that they enroll, and that we, um, depend on that we're keeping the rates the same for this coming year mm -hmm. and that's aggregated based on this budget we're trying to maintain the rates this year um, to really be a support to families coming out of covid you know times are a little difficult for a lot of folks so with the flat funding piece the flat rates uh, year over year that'll give them some relief as we begin to really look more deeply into it we really want to look at it from um, an analytical perspective and put put an algorithm to how we come up with the rates, and this is the year where we're really doing that to make sure we're aligned to our community, but also being beneficial to the families um, as much as we can. We, we don't we don't want to really run a profit. It's nice to have a fund balance, but we don't want to run a profit on families. Um, it's a really challenging time for them. So this budget, as you'll see, represents a reduction from prior years because of some of the work that we've done. Um, and a supporter of families accessing that program. So that's a dial down based on, on the number of students or based Great on? Great question. I was hoping you were going to ask that. It really has to do with the reorganization of how school age child care is looking. Um, because of the restructuring, we were able to look at our staff differently. There were some reductions in staff related to COVID because the numbers of students, of course, with schools being closed. Um, well, there wasn't a program per se. Consequently, we were able to really reevaluate how is SAC designed. And can we be more efficient and being more efficient, provide better services at a reduced rate for families? And this is the beginning of that. This budget represents the beginning of that. Oh, one more. Sure. Absolutely. I think, you know, the superintendent's letter always amazes me with his high needs students or the percentage mm -hmm. of high needs. Are there, is there a percentage of high needs in your category? We have not actually looked at that, but we do support all inclusive of all children to join our programming. So it really, it's a representation of Brantford Public Schools K through sixth grade. It could be students with disabilities, students with economic challenges, students with English language learner needs. All of those come into play um, at our school age child care. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions from the board? Questions from the general public or our TM members with regards to this budget, school age child care fund? Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Next up is Willoughby Wallace Memorial Library, page 52. Good evening. Hi. Yes, um, as you can see, we came in at 2.2%, which fits the guidelines that suggested by the finance department to start the budget um, process. Um, most of most costs are, are um, at the same levels as last year. Um, the Lion organization who provides our automation didn't do a very large increase, um, so that helped, um, kept the book budget the same. Um, the wages and salaries are, are union contracts, and the um, library staff, the part-time library staff, I, um, in discussion, we've, we've bumped up their hourly rates and reviewed some of the hours that we use to cover the library to give them a, an increase to um, keep in mind of the minimum wage increase that the state levels have, um, have been set at, for, especially for July, starting in July. Um, I want to give a shout out to the part-time staff for the past two years of working through COVID in the library and being nimble and enthusiastic and they brought a lot of innovative ideas to offer library services in a different way um, when people weren't coming able to come into the library as often um, with COVID, um, especially for children's programs. Um, Wendy, who offers story time, she's from Canada and she was willing to have story time until the snow started falling outside. And at one point, um, we had 50 toddlers and their caregivers for our like, toddler Woodstock. Um, we've, done, we've done a lot of work by bringing our archives to the public with programming, um, using staff, staff doing things in different ways. So I want to give them a real shout out for how they've handled the past times. But saying that, we hope we are edging towards normal now. We're starting programming um, with, with people in the building co in combination with some Zoom programming. Um, we hope by this summer that we're doing, we do our regular children's reading program. Um, so we hope to go forward um, with as much normalcy as possible in, in, in the coming year. Um, as far as revenues, we are starting to do a lot of passports. People must be expecting to travel because we're doing a lot of passports. We've already met the goal that I set for this year for income. Um, we have followed most of the Lion Libraries and the, the, Lion, the, the libraries around the state of Connecticut with offering a fine free service. And we only started that in February of this year. So we hope to, we expect to see fewer lost books as people are not afraid to bring things back late. Um, so we hope we will be seeing the report of that. We hope to see our room fees start up again because obviously people haven't been renting out the rooms for yoga classes during the past years, but we hope to see that start happening again as people are using the room for programs again. Um, so those numbers will probably go up. About it as far as um, your questions to the board on this budget? Mr. Quickie, uh, how's your revenues this year? Are they getting close? Well, I just checked today, and um, like I said, passports, I had I had budgeted that $3,000, and I think it was at 3030 So we're actually over that already, and it's only March. We, we, we're doing quite a few every month now. <coughs> So uh, room, room fees, we haven't been collecting room fees because we haven't rented out the rooms for the past year or two years. But those should start going up as people start saying, can we have yoga classes or, or whatever they want to rent the rooms for. Thank you. Other questions from William Wallace, presentation? Questions from RTM members and members of the public? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is James Blackstone Memorial Library, page 51. Welcome, 
welcome. How are you? Good. How are you? All right, good evening. Good evening, Chairman Mooney and Board of Finance members. I'm Karen Jensen. I'm the director of the Blackstone Library. And I have Beth Law, our president of the Board of Trustees, and Janice Kochanowski, our board treasurer. So thank you for the opportunity to present our budget for the 2023 fiscal year. The budget reflects three important factors. First, as you are aware, the library is continuing its commitment to ensure a sustainable endowment. Last year, both the Board of Finance and RTM agreed that the library needed to reduce its withdrawals from the endowment each year in order to preserve these funds for the future. We took the first step in that process by reducing the percentage of the annual withdrawal to 3.25% of the average of the last three year end balances. The second step, creates more predictability and less variation in the amount withdrawn from year to year by using the inflation factor of 2.25%, which was part of the Monte Carlo analysis completed last year. Accordingly, the proposed withdrawal of $88,397 represents the contemplated increase of 2.25%. Second, in looking at the year-over-year -year comparative figures, it's also important to note that most of the line items are in fact flat or reduced with the exception of contractual expenses. And third, the town established a sinking fund for capital expenses last year, and the requested amount of $35,000 is contingent upon needs for technology, replacement or upgrades, building repair and initiatives that result from our strategic planning and uses of the sinking fund will be subject to the town's regular oversight procedures, of course. A summary of the financials include expenses that total $1,850,938, which is a 3.18% year-over-year increase. And primary drivers of these expenses include the following. Uh, salaries, which is line 60,000, Total $1,004,538, which is an increase of 2.76% or $26,950. This increase is in line with the town's recommendation for unaffiliated personnel. It also reflects a mid-year merit increase for one employee who earned a master's degree in library and information science this year. Employee benefits and insurance increased by $27,380, or 7.7%, which reflects an estimated 8% um, increase in the cost of health insurance. And repairs and maintenance has increased by $7,000 over last year, which reflects a recommendation by the trustees building committee to improve grounds maintenance. We have also added window cleaning and carpet cleaning back into the budget. Materials of the collection, um, line 61,000, are $105,000, and that remains flat. And the development and fundraising line, uh, line 63,200, total $8,690, reflecting a $3,810 decrease year over year. And it's important to note that this expense line is balanced against income from these events, which is line 43,500. Um, income comes from several sources, including the town, program operations, contributions, development and fundraising, other grants, plus the draw from the endowment. So the program operations line 42,000, total $20,500, reflects no change. It no longer includes income from fines, because we abolished them last year. And it reflects reduced income from copier and printing fees. So to balance this, projected income from the auditorium has increased now that it's available for rental again. And contributions, which is line 43,000, total $57,500, which is an increase of $2,500, or approximately 4.5%, driven by a projected increase in direct appeals and a slight increase from donations. 
And the development and fundraising, line 43,500, totals $25,125. That's an increase of $1,125, or 4.7%. 4 and that's driven by projected income from planned events, including our successful shredding and mini golf events. The Town of Brantford Operating Grant, line 41,000, totals $1,650,816, which is an increase of $52,781, or 3.3%. As I highlighted earlier, this increase results primarily from a reduced draw from the library's endowment account. And again, the projected draw from the endowment reflects a 2.25% increase um, which is $88,397. So to summarize, the budget process starts with salaries, taxes, and health insurance for our employees, which at almost 80% of the total budget is our biggest expense. We complied with the town's directive for unaffiliated employees, increasing full-time rates by 2.25% and 2% for part-time employees with payroll taxes and a modest, modest estimate of health insurance increase, the amount totals $56,530. We are requesting most of this amount from the town. The balance will be made up by increasing, increasing our development and fundraising commitment, and the remainder will be withdrawn from the library's endowment found, found, funds. Sorry. Um, the total of all other expenses remains flat by adjusting line items in accordance with spending last year and the first six months of this fiscal year. So, as always, I want to recognize our business manager, Kathy Oxalita, who is here in the room, and um, for her expertise in putting this budget together, as well as our treasurer, Janice Kochanowski, and our assistant treasurer, Adam Spilka, who is also here, um, and President Beth Law for, for their support and additional input. Our team uh, continues to work very closely with uh, the first selectman, Jamie Cosgrove, and finance director, Jim Finch, and RTM member, chair of the education committee, and ex officio board member, Ed Pree, who all provide valued input into the budget process. And we also want to acknowledge um, board of finance me member, Jeff Follette, who is an ex officio member of our board, rep representing the board of finance. So thank you all very much for hearing our request. Thanks, Karen. Uh, question if I turn over the board. What's the endowment fund doing? So as a close of um, business today, total three million five hundred seventy-two thousand. Three million five seventy-two. It's with the market. There has been a lot of fluctuation, so it's sure. down a, a bit. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, questions from the board? Okay, so what's the life expectancy of the fund? life expectancy of the endowment fund. Yeah, of the endowment fund. Is there? I think maybe Jim can help you on that one. Yeah, you don't, you don't mind? Okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah, when we were looking uh, at this uh, back in 20, that was one of the questions that we wanted to solve for. And so looking at it back then, uh, we were looking at the endowment over a 30-year period and making sure, we wanted to make sure there was enough money uh, to last based on the, car, the asset allocation they were using at the time, the beginning balance, and as Karen pointed out, if we increase that by 2.25% per year. And so that, so we looked at a 30-year time horizon. Originally we looked at 50, but then that, that was a little bit more difficult to get our arms around. So we looked at a 30-year time period, and at which point I believe it was an 81% probability of being successful. In other words, in 81% of the time that that would be a successful uh, strategy. Now, having said that, uh, we're probably not going to wait uh, another till year 31 uh, to look at this again. I think we we haven't set a firm date. We were talking basically maybe looking at it every four to five years, kind of retesting that. You know, where where are we? You know, what are the assumptions going forward? Uh, the inflation assumptions may be different. We were using two and a quarter. That was done in a low inflationary time period. Uh, you heard the actuary tonight talking about inflation using 2.5%, using pretty much close to what Social Security uses. Uh, we do the valuations every other year, and so we sort of kind of ask the same thing about the solvency of the fund. 
Uh, but in this case, we'll probably look at it, like I said, at about uh, uh, another maybe three years to, to make it five years. But uh, so that is my long-winded way of answering a question. Thirty years was the time frame. I knew there was detail. Uh, you're okay with that, Janice? Uh, any other questions? Chad, you good? Okay. Good questions? Questions from the board? Uh, questions from RTM members or members of the public? All right, you're all set. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Next up, the moment we've all been waiting for it. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Chairman Mooney, uh, members of the uh, Board of Finance. My name is Peter Verdun, and I am the uh, Chairman of the uh, Board of Education. Um, I'm here tonight with uh, Superintendent uh, Hernandez and uh, Facilities Director Mr. Carbone. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Neal was unable to be with us this evening at a uh, prior standing engagement. Our apologies for that. Uh, our uh, proposed uh, budget to you is uh, for uh, $61,342,641. It represents a six, sorry, a 2.4% uh, increase over our prior year uh, request. Um, and with that, I think I will turn it over to Mr. Hamlet uh, for uh, any uh, details. Thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, good evening. Um, first of all, uh, Joe, to you and to your committee, thank you for uh, the schedule change. Uh, we, we were dealing with uh, a couple of COVID-related issues and, and, um, and just personnel issues, so we do appreciate it and uh, appreciate the flexibility. Um, as I was telling um, my assistant superintendent, this is my 12th budget. I'm just as nervous today as I was when I presented the first one, uh, and I guess that's a good thing. Uh, because it's good to still have butterflies and make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. But this evening I have the pleasure of presenting uh, about uh, next year's school budget, which is really hopefully it won't be the fourth school year of COVID. We are currently in the third school year of COVID, uh, when you really think about that. And, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, having said that, there's a few things that I'd like to highlight. Uh, first of all, um, I know Mr. Finch was probably a little bit surprised when there was no budget theme. Uh, it's, uh, I know he was surprised. He sent me a text. That's probably, why you're nervous. It's, uh, it's probably why. Uh, but the reality is, is that uh, while a budget theme has served the district and certainly the administration very well to really congeal their thoughts uh, relative to the budget, we did not feel it was appropriate this year. Uh, we were really uh, were being driven primarily by our health insurance. Uh, our budget increase, in, uh, and I have communicated uh, with, with the Board of Finance as well as um, with the first selectman, as well as Mr. Finch, as well as our board. Our board really looked at the budget because we really wanted to try to come in um, at a historical level where we have been, which is right around 2%. Uh, if you look at our budgets, historically what we've been doing. Um, this year, uh, I did not come in at that 2%. I came in slightly over 3%. Uh, the board adjusted uh, the budget uh, down to 2.4%, and, and it is important to note that that 2.4% uh, is at 100% of the medical insurance locked in suggested number, uh, as indicated in the transmittal letter. I just want to be really, really clear, but we did make some additional cuts uh, so let me start off by saying a, a few things around process. Um, we had over 395 families respond to our budget survey. We had over 60 community members that do not have school-age children respond to our budget survey. And we also had over 200 staff members that responded to our budget survey, uh, where we laid out um, potential uh, budget priorities and where they really, all three of them coalesced, was around class size, they wanted to maintain class size, and they wanted to make sure that there were supports for social and emotional learning. That's somewhat of an amorphous uh, term. You hear it a lot in the news. 
you see it on the news, you hear people talking about it, but really is creating a culture of learning in schools that is safe for all students. And our students have, frankly, they have, they've undergone uh, a very, very difficult time. Uh, when they become adults, they'll look back and they will assess on how we as adults handled that and guided them through it. And I think up to this point, with the support of the Board of Finance, with the Board of Education, and the RTM, we have been able to resource and provide really good learning opportunities, and, and in some instances, exceptional learning opportunities for our students. And I hope that we continue to do that. A third priority was enrichment opportunities. Last summer uh, was our first summer where we really had a robust extended learning opportunities for all of our children. We had about six weeks of that. Our teachers were frankly exhausted, but they really stepped up and they continued and they worked, many of them, into the summer for a six week period. Very, very well attended. We had over 500 students participating in that. We hope to replicate that this year. It's really, really important from a continuity of programming perspective that our kids stay connected and stay engaged in school, particularly as they've experienced a, a level of interruption. I've had the pleasure of meeting with Harry and, uh, and Charlie uh, in their annual, uh, I won't call it a cage fight, but they, they beat me up pretty bad. Uh, but in all honesty, it, uh, talking to them just, uh, just informally, I do mention the high needs of our school community. Right now, we have four out of 10 children classified as high needs. Let me define what that is. That's either a student that's identified having a specialized need, a student that is learning to speak English, or a student that is currently receiving uh, free or reduced meals. Now, with the uh, seamless summer, all of our students currently are receiving free meals. Uh, all of our students are. That is set to cease. That will no longer continue into next year unless the federal government through the Department of Agriculture extends that. Uh, right now, we don't have any indication that that particular program is going to continue. We anticipate that our families will once again have to start to apply for that need uh, and for that benefit and for that assistance. And we anticipate that those numbers are going to increase from pre-COVID numbers. So I don't think our high needs population is going to go below 40%. If anything, it'll maintain or potentially go a little bit higher. That does not mean that our children do not have high cognition. It just means that they come to school with an additional need that the state identifies. That's all that means. But what it does mean for us is that we need to resource our schools a little bit differently to support our children because they're coming, with a, they're coming to school with some different needs. But I just want to be really clear. It does not mean that they don't have ability and they, they cannot uh, function at high levels. They just need some additional support in some areas. Having said that, um, we have, um, just to give you an idea, I wanna frame this discussion a little bit before we actually start getting into numbers and we can certainly answer your questions. Um, the enrollment, uh, at the elementary level, our December enrollment was about 970 students and that's in three elementary schools. At Walsh it was 782 and at BHS it was 819. We also have students at the program where Mr. Chicarella uh, works at Indian Neck. We have, some, we have some specialized programming there. We also have as uh, students that we are responsible for up through age 21. And we also have some students that do not attend school uh, in Brantford, but that we are responsible for financially. So our, our enrollment numbers, uh, I believe it's, it's, in, your, it's in your book. Uh, you can see what that number is. But we're under 3,000. We are under 3,000. If you want, I could tell you what page that is, if you'd like. 46, if you, page 46. Yep. It's, uh, so the reason I mention that is because I think it's important to look at the population, the total population, and then to understand that they have different needs that we are attempting to address. Um, one of the things that this budget does, um, it reduces our full-time uh, equivalent certified staff members. Um, I mentioned that in the transmittal letter uh, to the board where we have 8.4 FTE reductions in our uh, certified staff. Certified staff are teachers as well as administrators. And the way that we are able to do that we are taking one, one reduction and then we are, actually two reductions, 
and then we are also classifying uh, the funding stream to, to grants, you know, either special education grants or the open choice grant, or actually it's just the open choice grant, I believe. You know, we're, we cannot sustain that in perpetuity, but we can certainly do that uh, this year. The reason that we did that is when we were looking and I was developing the budget with the administrative team and the teachers, uh, teacher leaders, we were over 3% we were over 3%. We would have been significantly, we would have been in the 5% had we not done some of that reclassification. And that simply was just not sustainable. That's not something that we would have been able to do, particularly looking at a 1.5 million increase in medical benefits that Lockton was telling us that's what we would need to budget. So we were really, it was a dilemma. It was a real, real dilemma uh, for the board. In addition, um, we also have seven retirements in this budget. There's seven retirements. Those retirements will be backfilled, meaning when those people leave, we will hire. And we use a planning number of a master step seven. That doesn't mean that we, the first question we ask the candidates is, are you, do you have a master's degree? And do you have six years of experience? Of, I mean, seven years of experience. It's a planning number. Um, some of those teachers are at the secondary level, so it's hard to get an entry-level secondary teacher. We want teachers that have a little bit more experience. At the elementary level, there's many, many applicants for one position, and typically we do not have to pay top dollar to backfill an elementary position. Uh, so we feel as if that, that's a very, very good planning number. And that salary is about just under 65000 a master step seven. The likelihood that every backfill will be that is, um, it's not great, uh, but when you, when you average it out, that's pretty much where we land. Um, the other piece, I also, just as we frame this, um, for, for, for the Board of Finance, when we talk about um, the FTEs, in 2021, we had 298 F, uh, 0.7 FTEs. I believe that's on page six um, of your of the board's book. And then we budgeted for 20, 21-22, 302. And now we're back down to 294. What you see there is the interplay between those grants. And if you went back to 1920, uh, we would have added four additional teachers, and that was Project Lead the Way. That was a program that the board endorsed. Uh, we have yet to go through a full non-COVID year with that, pro with that program. That's an elementary science-based type program, very hands-on, uh, and we feel very strongly that that program should stay in, in existence. Uh, our kids would not otherwise necessarily get science instruction at the elementary level. And with the new standard of NGSS, that's critically important. So I'm just going to pause there and just to see if there's any questions up to this point. Um, questions at this point? I think we're good to have you carry on. Okay. Um, if I can now just talk a little bit about um, the, um, the medical self-insurance. Um, the health insurance number is um, just, just the health insurance. It's just under 1.2 million. And then we add the RX, and that's just under 600,000. Uh, you put those two numbers together, it, it's, it's a big number. It's about 1.8. Um, that, that number uh, is, a, is a number that we get from our third party uh, administrator, Lockton. Uh, we meet regularly with them, with the town, uh, with Mr. Finch, the first selectman. That number is, as I said earlier, we have 100% of that number. Uh, in our current budget. Uh, I had provided some historical data compared to what we actually budgeted, and what we budgeted is actually what we actually budgeted and actually was paid. And then there's actual claims. Uh, that delta uh, is where we feel as if there's even more room to reduce the board's budget. Uh, each percentage point is about $82,000. Um, that is something that the board discussed uh, in, in open session um, 
and we said, well, typically what we have done is we've worked with the town very closely, uh, and that is something that certainly the Board of Finance relative to anything un under 100% is something that is done through this body and through Mr. Finch and the first selectman. Um, the current Board of Education looked at that because, again, they were looking to come in at a budget that was around 2%, uh, understanding the sustainability of that. It's also important to note that this year is the, is the first in the, the last two years, actually, let me put it this way, the last two years, we actually took on some additional expense. That was part of the kind of the smoothing of the medical self-insurance. We had amended our budget. That was actually articulated in previous uh, transmittal letters. We did not have that this year. Uh, had we had to do that, the percentage would have gone even higher. Uh, so you can see uh, that the board really took great strides. One, to preserve class size, to preserve programming, to ensure that we were uh, continuing with the program that we have in Bradford Schools, but also being mindful that we could not ask uh, for something that was north of four or five percent. When you think about the possibility of having um, the 6.4 positions that I talked about that we reclassified into grants, uh, and as well as the two reductions in FTE, real reductions, that we're going to cut. Our, our budget number would have been exceedingly high. Just to give you a comparable number, most of the surrounding towns, their superintendents came in with budgets uh, either in the, in the threes or in the fours. Uh, just to give you a perspective on that. Um, so again, that was really the major, major driver in our budget, in our current budget. One of the additional things that you have this year in the budget book is um, we implemented an athletic director. Um, this is something that the board worked on, public session, very openly. Uh, we used to have um, two athletic directors that were teachers, uh, and our athletic programmings had expanded to the intermediate school. We did not have any oversight of the athletic program administratively um, at the intermediate school because they needed to be certified. In order to have oversight of athletic programs at two different sites, you need to have the appropriate certification. Uh, working, with the, um, working with existing staff, we actually ended up having, and we did the cost analysis, we added one administrative position, and I talked about this over a year ago, both at the RTM as well as here, and certainly with the board, at a savings, at a savings, we added one administrator because we were paying for teachers, teacher salary, as well as the release time of those teachers, uh, which was 0.5, half of their teaching assignment they did not do, and we were paying them a stipend in addition uh, to do that. And then there was expenses associated with each event. Uh, when we did all of that analysis, uh, we determined that we can have one athletic director have oversight of both intermediate as well as high school and supervise the coaches as well as evaluate teachers, the PE and health teachers. And that was a much better, much more cost effective piece. You'll see this uh, when you look at that page and the personnel page on page, page six when you see where we went from the athletic director from 2021 to 2122, and you see that additional administrator. That's on the, uh, let's see that we saw. Joe, it's on page six, six under 10, where it says uh, administrators. Okay. And it's actually, the additional point one is someone that's uh, that's a, we have a dean of students, uh, our dean of students, uh, and again, uh, we used to have a dean of students at the high school. With declining enrollment at the high school, we had two assistant principals and a dean of students. We took the dean of students and we made that individual a district asset, and that is the social and emotional coordinator. Uh, that, that individual is doing the coordination of all of our programs pre-K through 12, safe school climate, 
uh, so that individual is not even at the high school anymore. That individual actually works out of Indian Neck. Uh, they do all of our investigations, our bullying investigations, our safe school climate plan, as well as our proactive uh, supports for our students, behavioral supports for our students. As opposed to adding somebody, we reallocated that resource knowing that we did not need the same number of, of individuals at the high school. So we did that very proactively without asking for, for new headcount. So on page six on the administrators, 17.8. Yeah, it went from the, the athletic director would bring it to 17.7, and then the, the dean of students that we added one tenth of a position uh, to her because. And what that means, Joe, is she went, she was, um, Dean of Students was a 10 month position, follow the school calendar, and administratively, <coughs> when we negotiated that, uh, that individual does not follow the full administrator's contract, but more than a teacher's contract. And that individual is in the administrator's contract, though. And we did that through negotiations. And then I might add also, and that's actually a good segue. This contract also reflects four settled labor contracts um, in the cost of that. We settled the nurse's contract, we settled the custodian contract, we settled the administrator's contract, and we settled the Brantford administrative support staff contract. Um, so those, and those increases were competitive and they are part of this budget. And we only have six labor unions and we had to settle four of those contracts this year. Uh, next year, we will be negotiating one contract, and that's our paraprofessional contract. That's the only contract that we will negotiate next year. <coughs> Question, Mr. Chairman? Sure. <clears throat> Hamlet, under page six again, classified, um, as, as you've been telling us over the last few years with that increase in, I call it the special needs, the 40%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, it seems like you've been holding pretty good with that support staff. I mean, you know, uh, I think the past year uh, nurses have probably taxed themselves out over the last few years with the COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully we don't have a fourth, but you're, you're looking to hold on that mm -hmm. with eight. And the uh, paraprofessionals, you know, you went up a bit. So you're, I'm assuming that you're comfortable with this as you're presenting it because it seems like that constantly grows, constantly mm -hmm. grows. And I'm just looking at, you're going to be able to hold the impact of influx of, <clears throat> excuse me, more uh, children with problems. Mm -hmm. Well, I th I, you know, in the, when we think about the, the way that we staff with our classified uh, teaching staff, first of all, uh, the staff in general, I cannot say enough about what the staff has done during COVID. Uh, from pivoting uh, to working fully remote um, to the hybrid model to now full in person to now the transition uh, with the mask. I spent the better part of today uh, in nine different classrooms in the afternoon. Kids had masks on, some didn't, some teachers had on. The, the beauty of that is that it was not an issue. Uh, the, it was accepted. Relative to the needs and how we staff that, um, I will tell you, Harry, that um, it's dynamic and we have some vacancies currently. This is the number that we need, but we also are experiencing some labor issues. We also are experiencing, particularly, particularly uh, with our our non-certified staff, uh, the market is the labor market is competitive, uh, and I think we see that all over the place. One of the things that we do do uh, with Mr. Chicarella, uh, particularly, is those paraprofessionals that work with some of our children that have specialized needs. Uh, we invest in them; they are highly trained, so we don't want them to walk. We want them to. We want to be able to retain them, uh, and that is certainly something that we, we keep an eye on. Thank you. Uh, Hamlet, on, on page uh, 24, up at the, up at the top, uh, 
uh, non-certified uh, increased uh, from 16 positions by uh, by one tenth of a position, yet the the salaries went up by 9.1 percent. But but there's only one tenth of a position increase. I, I was confused by that. Those are. All of those non-certified, and, and that's a great question, Victor. Those contracts that I just talked about, non-certified are, are the custodians. They are the bass individuals. They are uh, the the nurses. So anybody who's not certified, those those salaries are represented there. So those lit, those increases, we just wanted to show that we added one tenth. It's probably some additional, like a day, if you will from an FTE perspective, but the wage increase is reflective of the labor of the contracts. That is that retroactive, some of that retroactive? Or um, I don't think we paid, actually one was, now don't quote me on that, I'm, I'm pretty sure the custodians was retroactive, uh, part of it, you know. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, I can get back to you though on that, I don't. I appreciate that, yes, know. please. Charlie. Okay, well, on the medical insurance. Like you funded it 100%, and yeah, you, know, you look back and you have a five-year track record where it's it's overfunded by about seven percent. So over the uh, this uh, delta or the or the spread is about seven percent. Why wouldn't the board of ed take a crack at reducing it to something like 95 percent or? Yeah, or rather I, than yeah. asking the board of, I'd be, I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to take that. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, quite, quite frankly, Charlie, um, as you know, the excess uh, uh, contributions go into a into a fund balance that's held and controlled by the town. Uh, we didn't think that since it is a fund balance and it's not within our control that it would be appropriate for the board of education to make that determination. And so we leave it to you to make that determination. And we highlighted that in our transmittal letter. I did have a conversation with Mr. Finch about that, as well as Mr. Cosgrove. Um, and so we, we do recognize that. We felt as though since Lockton gave us that number, and again, since we don't have control over the fund balance, that it would be appropriate for you to make that reduction as opposed yeah, to Yeah, but us. if you've already turned money back into the fund balance, what's the difference? The, the difference, the Charlie, is the it, 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 it's the yeah. process over the yeah. past couple of years. Yeah, so maybe Jim can highlight some of this. Yeah, yeah, we've outlined the process. So if you think about it, the town is the insurance company. So the town is getting estimates, because the town is technically in the insurance business, from Anthem and Lockton. Yeah. And, and as the analysis, which thank you, by the way, shows that uh, Lockton and Anthem have historically been higher yeah. than the actuals. Now, we know this because the fund balance grew. So the fund balance wouldn't grow if we were paying out more than what we are taking in. And so one of the things that we've done the last two years is we said, okay, if we're gonna fund less than 100% of claims, how would we approach this? So let's blend those based on lives because that would be an equitable way of distributing the fund balance. But that was always done <clears throat> on the town side. And then uh, what, we, what we did is we gave the Board of Ed you know, like last, I think last year was 700,900 something. So we would, so that's what the Board of Ed would request. And then what we would do is then budget some number less than 100% of claims. So let's say 97%. And then the Board of Ed budget was reduced by about 282,000 last year, okay? Which meant that the 400 something and change was still in the Board of Ed's budget to reflect that allocation of covered lives. So they are, they are correct that what, Basically, as as most of this board has taken the position, as myself and the first selectman, is that if is it you know the source of the funds is the town. So, like I said, it flows from the town to the board of ed, back to the source. And so, in that scenario, uh, we're basically looking at this that the town is basically making those decisions because they're acting like the insurance company. The the board of ed, uh, as pointing this out, is similar to what we used to do. Uh, many years ago, uh, when we were fully insured, we used to look at claims versus premiums, and then we would ask Anthem through our broker to, to consider giving us uh, a haircut. And so what the board is basically saying is, based on a similar analysis, uh, you know, we, we think we could 
deal with a haircut. And if we deal with a haircut, uh, it'll allow us to reduce our request, uh, which uh, not, not everyone in the community, I mean, you know, I don't think we're necessarily tied to a percentage here. To, and I, I remember when I first met Hamlet, he was saying, you know, you can't be dismissive of the optics, but you got to be aware of the optics. And I think the, that the optics in Brantford, um, in some circles, is, is the 2% number. I think that the board has, has internalized that. It, not, there's not anything magical about it, but that's been, a, been sort of a target. So my read on this is that the board, like I said, is acting uh, in a way that a, one may go to their own insurance company and say, hey, uh, we would like a haircut. Uh, we have the data that supports the haircut. Uh, and, you know, the numbers don't lie. And Anthem and uh, Lockton are, are higher in those cases, which is a good thing. I mean, I wouldn't want Anthem and Lockton to be the lower numbers. That, that, that would be a, a, certainly an adverse selection. And so, uh, so they're asking us to do this in a way that doesn't impact them programmatically because, they're board, because the board is faced with a, a number of challenges going into the fourth year of COVID, four out of 10 students uh, with special needs. And we're also obviously operating uh, in an inflationary environment. Uh, and, and as he said, he's, he has some challenges uh, with some of the uh, staff and paraprofessionals and they uh, provide a critical role, especially given the high percentage of student needs. So again, uh, I think that's really what's at issue here, what, what we're discussing. But uh, I don't think, Charlie, you want to sort of cede that responsibility back. Right, it's not in their purview, yeah. essentially. <laughs> okay, it's, it's at the board level and after the fact to say, okay, yes, we go at 98% or 97%, and that's what we've done on a historical basis. Okay. So, Victor. Uh, oh, Jim, excuse me. How are the uh, administrative costs allocated for the reinsurance? Is that, should that be added to the claims cost? I mean, when you compare... Uh... Well, when we, when we allocated, when we were allocating it based on lives, uh, we did include these, you talk about the aggregate and individual stop loss. Yes. Was, was included in that claims number, was my recollection. Mm -hmm. The things that were not included uh, in the claims numbers were like some of the ancillary benefits, uh, for example, life insurance, uh, the town has, a, has what was called an F plan. It's a fully insured plan for retirees. And also uh, the HSA contribution stayed within the respective groups. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, other questions? Mr. Chairman, I, I believe that's the highlight, uh, really. I mean, that, that is really the substantive issue. I, and I think uh, certainly I know that you've had the book for a period of time. If there's any question that you have about a particular line item, uh, I'm happy to take that. Uh, I just don't want to go through every Thank single you. line. And, uh, and then if there are no questions, then we're, we're certainly happy to transition into the capital. Uh, that's, that's fine. Let me just see if there's any questions on the operating. Uh, board of Ed, uh, RTM members, members of the general public. Questions for the Board of Ed regarding the credit budget presentation and the operating budget? Okay, we'll move on to the capital. The, this year's capital is, is a little bit unique um, in that. Uh, First of all, I can't thank uh, Mr. Finch and the first selectmen. They, they have always been very supportive and very instrumental um, in, in, in helping us devise our capital. We want to see, see one. That is correct. That is correct. There's a few things that I would just like to bring to your attention. Uh, on page C1, where it says buildings, if you can find that, and then it says update to servery. Um, and, and in 21-22, $120,000 was approved for that. And then you'll see in 22-23 that there's parentheses around that number. Uh, the, our, our, uh, food service program has been 
and really doing exceedingly well with the seamless summer and we have generated revenues that actually now will cover the repairs and the, and the work at the servery. Uh, just last week the Board of Education took action uh, so that we would repurpose that $120,000 back to something else. It's something one of my, the, the chairman of the Board of the uh, Education Committee always speaks to uh, myself and Mr. Neal about is possibly about repurposing funds. Uh, that's a good story uh, because if you recall about three years ago uh, our food service program we were subsidizing that I think at one year almost a hundred thousand dollars or just north of a hundred thousand dollars you'll see in this year's budget there is no subsidy there is no subsidy that is there's a little there's some risk because when we put that together the seamless summer program was still going on uh, but we still feel as if uh, that we're in a good position to be able to repurpose that $120,000. And that's why you see, parenthetically, uh, in years 22-23, we won't be needing that money, and we'll go through the RTM process. I believe it goes to Ways and Means. Um, is that correct, Jim? I'm sorry, what it was that? It goes to Ways and Means in the RTM? Yeah, the... Uh, so basically, the uh, you're talking about the redesignation request? The redesignation process. Yeah, so... Um, you, the Board of Finance is actually meeting on Monday the 28th, so it would probably be a good opportunity to, to send that letter okay. to them so they could consider it on, on, the, uh, on the 28th. So, in, so that 120 negative is the presumption is that it can be allocated to those other possible Yes, we want to, be, we want to reallocate uh, that 120. Um, we want to, in the, in the capital budget, there's a JBS architectural study. I, we requested that in the past and it received uh, some questions and it has not been funded. It's one, it is something that was also articulated in the transmittal letter that the Board of Education is looking at uh, what, what can be done at JBS. Uh, it is uh, our oldest elementary school. It is a former high school. Uh, it's an iconic building. Uh, but we need to start looking at, from a long-range facilities standpoint, what can we do with that building? And if we did have to do something, what would be the cost associated with that? So we really want to try to conduct a study to see what, what are the bones of the building, from the power plant to the electrical service. We ran into some challenges even last summer when we tried to put some split units in just to cool the building off. We could not put one in. Uh, a split unit into the cafeteria because the service that was coming into the building was just not adequate, uh, wouldn't support it. So there's some limitations uh, in that building and I believe that looking forward we need to start looking at that. Uh, that was, um, some of the dollars would be reallocated to that and then we also reallocated um, 20000 each to Mary T. Murphy and to Disco for tile work. Mr. Carbone can talk about that and then to remove our underground tanks, 30,000 for to remove um, four underground tanks. Uh, right now, uh, of the four, uh, there's one that probably we would hold on to for a period of time, and that's JBS, the JBS one. I did misspeak, uh, Mr. Chairman, the other day when I said that the one in Indian Neck had been taken out, Joe corrected me, and uh, we did do the, the septic uh, connect but we did not remove the underground tank. The tanks have not been abandoned, but they're not being utilized. And Joe, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Use this one. The um, <clears throat> majority of the schools, we have dual fuel burners, which is gas and oil, both. Um, for the past seven years, we've been just burning gas at the majority of the schools except for Sinai. Sinai has no gas coming into it from the outside. So Sinai is strictly oil. So even though, just a side note, even though you don't, you're only using one gas, do you test the... We haven't tested, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. We maintain those, so we, we have an outside into company it. comes in and does yeah. a periodic testing. We don't want to, we want to try to avoid a, a mess, an environmental mess of, of an abandoned tank that hasn't been made hasn't been looked at and we want to avoid that. And then lastly, uh, we had a project, the BHS dugout uh, press box, and that was for the girls softball field. 
Uh, we did the dugouts, but we were unable to build a press box because of the wetlands. So there's a residual on that account, uh, and we want to re repurpose that for system-wide door replacement. We periodically, you can imagine, I, I don't know the number of doors offhand that we have, uh, but it's pretty significant, and we periodically need to replace doors. Um, so we want to repurpose or redesignate those dollars. And then we also uh, did some elevator work, uh, and we had some residuals in that account of about 15000 and we wanted uh, to put that into bathroom uh, renovations. And I, I'm not quite sure if renovations is the, is the right word, uh, but, but it's really some of our bathrooms uh, periodically need to be upgraded. Um, and it's just really part of, part of just maintenance of when you have so many children and adults and people using bathrooms, they just need periodic maintenance. So we want to repurpose those dollars. The big piece on, on uh, well, let me stop there and make sure there's no questions relative to anything I've said there. Um, yeah, I was looking for the dugout. I didn't see the dugout. Um, Joe, you, you, you won't see that because that was in, in years past. Um, so that's part of the redesignation. And if I confused, if I was confusing you with that, the uh, we are redesignating a total of, I want to say, 100 and $45,000. Okay, so you're showing 120 years. So. Right. The other, the other uh, 25000 plus is actually from projects that have been approved in previous fiscal years that do not show up in this five-year calendar. Okay. So we wouldn't see it here? No, okay. no. Right. Okay. Uh, I talked about the... Uh, the Tiles. Um, the um, the other piece that I just want to bring um, to your attention is, and this was also mentioned in the transmittal letter, the board's uh, really uh, goal of addressing indoor air quality at the elementary schools. Uh, that is uh, since COVID, that has gotten a tremendous amount of attention. Uh, so much so that at the state. Uh, I know our governor is looking to add some additional dollars for school construction, specifically for indoor air quality, um, not necessarily just cooling off an area. Uh, I mean, it's more than just that. Um, and one of the things that we are looking to do is use some of the ARP dollars. Uh, we have uh, $1.5 million that was provided uh, to the board as uh, the ESTER dollars. And then another 3.4 million for um, the ARP dollars, American Recovery Program. We're looking to use uh, 1.9 million of those dollars to try to uh, bring in air conditioning into the elementary schools. Um, and that's those dollars are apportioned across the board. Um, it's 750 for Tisco and Murphy. Um, and then another uh, 400000 for JBS. Uh, not knowing exactly what we would be doing at JBS, uh, and that's where the connection is to the study to see how would we be able to do that. I don't want to mislead anybody. I think uh, 400000 I'm not an expert with this, but 400000 for free air conditioning in a three-story building of an older building I, I think that's probably a very, very low number, uh, very, very low number. However, those dollars coupled potentially with school construction dollars, and right now our reimbursement rate is 35 cents to a dollar. Uh, you, you do that together and potentially you bundle the three projects and you extend them over multiple years. Uh, and again, very preliminary, but it is important uh, to note that there are timelines associated with the dollars, uh, the ESSER dollars, as well as the ARP dollars. Um, 23, uh, September of 23 and September of 24, uh, those are times, and there is some, you know, I've heard conversation on whether it needs to be encumbered by that date, and it can be spent later. And I will tell you that school districts, uh, talking to my colleagues, school districts uh, are, don't want to build a cliff, uh, 
with hiring personnel and suddenly grant dollars go away and you can't, you can't support it, you can't get the dollars to keep the people, and um, you can't even get minimal people uh, because of the labor shortage. So some districts are having some challenges in spending the grant dollars. Uh, I anticipate that that will change. Um, we still have some time, but this is uh, potentially 1.9 million um, of the ARP dollars. Uh, so it's just about, you know, just under a half, um, right? It's 3.4, so it's actually um, you know, a little bit more than half of that. But you're estimating a million five for the air conditioning. Yes, we and we haven't put in the, the, the we haven't put in the additional 400 into the actual grant revision yet. Uh -huh. We're waiting to see uh, how this would pan out right now, Joe, uh, with the Board of Finance and the RTM. Right, but you're estimating for Mary Murphy 2.250. Right. When you look at those, those are what I was talking about is the 1.9 of ARP right. dollars to use that. That's the four right. 750 to 750. That is correct. To offset those three larger projects. That's correct. And so, um, so just can you explain to us a little bit about how the original, I believe they're around 300,000. It was. I don't know the exact number, Joe, but I know it was. It was. It was. It was pretty low. Uh, yeah, it was pretty low. Yep. And we did an engineering. We actually, Mr. Neal, uh, when we started to look at this, had an engineering firm uh, come in and look at that. And one, the duct work. Uh, and Joe, you can speak to this better than I can. Uh, the, the duct work that we thought we could just tie into with the engineering firm, we can't. So we have to add all new duct work at Murphy and Tisco for the air conditioning. Why? Can you explain a little further on that? Um, they said because of the way the HVAC is set up now, we need to run new duct work for the air conditioning separately. I'm happy, though, Joe, I, you know, if, if we were going to be doing this in earnest, we would... Um, Certainly have that engineering firm come back and in, uh, and present so that they can. Uh, do you have a study on that? Do we we do have we, we have a we have a a study that the engineering firm. It's, it's a short study. Uh, it's it's not. Um, I would say it, it's comprehensive enough that it gave us a much more realistic number uh, to plan for. Have you seen that study? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll get that to you. I thought Don had sent that over. Yeah. No. Okay. Joe, is the duct work undersized? For what? I'm sorry. Is the duct work undersized for the HVAC capabilities? That we currently have now? Right. That's only in two schools. There is no duct work at, uh, you know, Sunny has no duct work. No, I know. I, I can see that. that. You got to increase yeah. fees there, but. Yeah. Does that Sliney system also include electrical upgrades? Yes. Sliney, yeah, that number. Right? That number includes electrical. Sliney, we need to do an electrical upgrade to add any more anything to that building. Correct. Charlie? Well, I'm sorry, Victor and then and Okay, Charlie. yeah. Also, on air conditioning, you need return air ducts, right? For, to recover the cooled air? Yes. So that you probably don't That's have That's all that. part of what they're adding on. Yeah. Okay. This is federal money, and yes. uh, like you mentioned something about a commitment to the the use of the money, because what if you can't get the materials, and what do you have to do to control the money? Mm -hmm. the, they have not, you know, I have not read anything, nor have I seen anything from the federal government uh, addressing any sort of supply uh, chain issues or delays in making, encumbering the dollars, and then when you can't, in fact, for whatever reason, you're unable to expend them, 
by a certain date. I have not seen that, but I would anticipate uh, that we will see that, uh, knowing at least in my, in, in my world of superintendents and talking to my colleagues, some of the struggles and challenges that they have right now, um, spending the dollars, that I would not be surprised that to, for that to be released by the federal government. But I don't know that to be certain. I mean, so there's no time limit when you have to spend these dollars? Oh, there is. There is. There is. There is. That's as I reported. If you can't get the material, then what? It's, uh, well, we would, be, we would pivot. We, we would be looking at uh, potentially, um, there are other things, uh, and again, 1.9 is not all of our dollars. We're looking to invest those dollars uh, in other areas for behavioral supports, effective school solutions. It's a program where we would bring potentially, and it's. I'm not saying that's the program. I'm using that as an all example. Right, so you got Plan B and Plan C. Exactly, state. bringing okay. somebody in to work with our staff, with our students, uh, for a short, short period of time, um, and then once we've addressed the issue, those folks would go away. We're not building that cliff where we would have to maintain that. Uh, so that's certainly Plan B and Plan C. Yes. Yes. That that report I do know that the, the first selectman talked about. I know that, that is something that the, the Board of Education commissioned the last June, uh, I believe, Peter, right at the end of the year, um, as um, as the Walsh project uh, comes to a close, uh, fields became an issue, uh, and one of the things that we did is we worked with Antonazzi and Associates. Uh, they were the lead architect on the project. They worked with, Jamie, you helped me, the, the uh, Stantec. Stack, St Stantec, Stantec. Um, they were the civil engineers, is that correct, Jamie? You know, so they, uh, they were very familiar with the site. Uh, they met with our athletic director uh, around, as well as the building principal, as well as uh, the director of park and rec, around what were the needs of that field and what, what did we need programmatically as a school district. And then also, how would it, though, that field be used? Um, concurrently, and I defer to the first selectman, uh, we did that piece. And what you see here is the, the school's needs. Uh, this is to put this on your radar screen. But I, I think there's a parallel process. And this will hopefully inform the work that you're doing. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so we had started, so we, the town has started a process where we're well, laying out a process to look at all of our facilities and the needs that exist, not only through uh, school programs, but also the community at large. And uh, I think it'd be worth to, to take a full evaluation of our facilities and identify a plan to address uh, not only the current demands, but also evaluate where the trends are going uh, with uh, both you know, with sports and, and the field use and develop a plan based off of that information. So that's something we're at the, in the beginning process of. I, I, I noticed in one of the out years, you have a boiler in here for $600,000. Which that sign, there's two boilers there. Well, even 300 each is a lot, it seems. That is. That is, how, that is a quote that we have at the Wow. Okay. And again, one of the things that you do see on this, Victor, is that uh, we're start slimy because of just of its age. It's, a, it's an older building. So there'll be, we'll reach a point uh, where we're putting money into a building uh, that perhaps we should just pause and just say, what do we want to do with the building? And the board is starting to have that discussion. Uh, and again, that's not a discussion that happens in a vacuum. I mean, in the same way, you know, we, we have to have that discussion with the first selectman, with the, with the finance director, with the board of finance. Uh, but it is something that we're getting to that point. We need to start thinking about that in the out years. Thank you. Yeah, when you mentioned the uh, American recovery dollars, yep. I know you gave us a recap um, a couple of weeks ago. Can you get on that briefly? 
you're, ask, you're estimating to allocate 1.9 million of it towards these capital items. Can you, can you maybe provide us a recap? Sure, sure. First of all, yep, yep. Happy to do that, Joe. And, uh, what we're talking about is the ESSER II. Uh, the, the district received, uh, for ESSER II, the district received $1.5 million. Um, for the American Recovery, sometimes it's referred to as ESSER, sometimes yeah, people refer to it. Yeah, Jim, what's the date on that? Is that? Uh, yeah. Yep, yep. It's, um, yeah. There's a couple of things that are going on here. One, there's there's categories. Um, the state, uh, the federal government, you know, gives us um, a rather long document um, like this and tells us uh, the do's and don'ts of what the dollars can be used for. In other words, you, know, you, you can't build turf fields. Uh, some districts have attempted to do things like that. But you, know, you can certainly use them uh, for something like to enhance indoor air quality in buildings. That's something that's been, people are talking about. That would fall under building safety and health of schools. There's another category addressing uh, learning or loss, learning loss and gaps. There's a category for social and emotional men mental well-being of students. Uh, there's a category for summer learning. We have been putting some money into our summer learning into our uh, extended learning opportunities. There's family outreach uh, piece that we needed to do. And then there's equipment and repairs to minimize disease and spread of disease, uh, the spread of disease. Those, uh, those mitigation pieces, uh, I'd like to say that we're through that uh, for the most part, uh, but I think we still need to be poised if something happens. And let me give you a concrete example. We started, we, we rented tents for a period of time. Uh, all of our schools had tents because we wanted to make sure that the lunch waves, we were dispersing children as much as we could in our schools. Uh, now, uh, the uh, Tisco and Murphy, the way that they, where they, their, their media center is also their cafeteria, uh, unlike JBS. So we have nuances in our schools. So we still need to use some things like tents at times uh, those, some of those dollars have been encumbered already. Uh, to date, uh, we have already committed around just under five, just over five hundred thousand uh, dollars. We have to go through a budget revision, but we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Uh, we want to go through this process first, uh, and then go back to the state and revise the budget. We anticipate that uh, we will use. The majority of the dollars uh, for addressing learning loss um, as well as the building safety and health. Uh, that's where the, the majority of the dollars will be used as well as the social and the emotional supports for our students. So, so the question is, uh, are these dollars, are these all expected to be expended in the next year? Or no, we have, uh, we, we have until um, again, September of 2024 for the 3.4 million. Right. And then September of 2023 for the 1.5. Now, what happens after the grants are gone? Well, that's, once those grants are gone, um, what we don't want to do is be spending, uh, spending the dollars on labor. Um, that once those grants are gone, we have essentially built a cliff for ourselves. So as I was trying to articulate before, we want to try to avoid that. Uh, so if we bring in, for instance, social and emotional supports, if we can bring something into, into the district for a period of time to address a particular issue, that's how we will use that, those dollars. So that when we address it and we have remedied whatever the issue may be, so they're not capitalized necessarily, but they're projects or they're, Well, we can use, yeah, they, they could be, you can use, use them for projects like what we were just talking about, right. uh, for the building of, um, in our schools, the health and safety piece of it. Right. 
the indoor air quality. But the majority of it is for uh, instructional pieces. There's actually a 20% holdback on it uh, for learning loss. So it's, it's, it's earmarked clearly at least 20% of that is for learning loss. Regarding, I think when you were, when you were talking about the air conditioning, I think you stated that it would, uh, there's potential for state reimbursement on that. If you, met, you mentioned about, we get a, we're currently a 35% reimbursement. I know we had talked and that that is something that this state is contemplating. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any movement on that or? No, it, it's just what I've reported here that the, this evening, Jamie, that the, the governor has been talking about that. Oh, yeah, so in, he, in, he, in, uh, okay. In, and I know, um, and I sent some, some of that information um, along that there is, there is certainly a move afoot to try to increase dollars for school construction, particularly in this area for indoor air quality, mm -hmm. but I have not seen anything specific yet. Yeah, no, I just didn't know if you had any information. No. Nope. Then the, one other question with the underground storage tank, Joe, did you say there was, um, obviously Sliney still has it because it, we, it, we, have, we currently it. have four. You currently have four. Are you Sliney, we're keeping. Yep. Tisco, we're removing. Indian Neck. We're looking to remove in 1111 Main Street. All right, that's the one I was looking at. <laughs> Speaking of 1111 Main Street, this our current budget, our current but our current budget uh, has about five thousand dollars in utilities. We anticipate that uh, through board action, we will rededicate uh, the building back to the town by the end of the by the end of this calendar year. Okay. So have you moved into the new facility? Uh, yes and no. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, some folks at central office have been there. Um, you know, there are still some folks here at 1111. Some of that, Joe, has to really to do with being able to turn on turn systems off and on, and we don't necessarily want to do that in the middle of a school year. Uh, so, but we we've started to do a migration uh, over. Other questions on the, the air conditioning, right? Is that any contemplation of any other uh, technologies in the air quality, or is it just strictly heating and cooling, or is there any other type of um, fire mitigation or any of that sort of thing? I'm not conversing. I, I, I'd have to. So I strictly air conditioning is really to my knowledge. Looking at the mechanical structure. Right? Are you talking more like a, from a building management standpoint? Well, um, yeah, building management, but it, like I say, it went from 300,000 to a 2.2 million, which is, if it's ducts, it's electrical, it's, it's basically cooling. It's not anything beyond the cooling. You know, we have heating already, so right, it's not strictly dealing with the air quality no, right. and through it. So well, if, the, if there's a filtration system, you know. Right, that's right. part of the air yeah. quality HVAC. Right. Yeah. Unlike a split unit that we put some into into Sliney, and as Jamie pointed out, that was just cooling off. It wasn't taking, not like you're taking humidity out of the air and fil filtering the air, you know, like a true HVAC system. Yeah, we're looking for negative uh, air pressure in the school. Not when we did that, no. Okay, okay. and then the uh, question: the new facility. Uh, of operating that relative to the old facility before. I'd have, I, we haven't gone through a full year yet. I can tell you that. Uh, the we can we can do we can do some comparisons with that. I did not come prepared to, to talk about that tonight. And uh, Joe, we can probably get those reports. Mm -hmm. Electric and, and, and so, the, as far as the electric, it's kind of there's a lot more that we're running over there now, so it's kind of an equal balance. It's a, possibly a little less, but it's kind of equal to because we have so many more HVAC units and everything else on the roof now. Right. Um, other questions regarding capital requests, Victor? I just had a question about the pool at, at uh, Walsh. Is that open? Yes, we threw Mr. John O'Connor in first because <laughs> uh, he's uh, it's named after him, and uh, and he was a. Uh, 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 really a revered coach. We, did, we had a really nice ceremony 
and we had Mr. O'Connor. Uh, some of, uh, I did not realize that Brantford had all American swimmers. Uh, they were twin girls, uh, they were there. Uh, they're grown women. Um, we also had a few other alumni, and we had some kids there, and it was a really, really nice ceremony. And today was the first day after school that our uh, swim program started. Uh, we were able to secure some lifeguards. Uh, so, and then hopefully by next week we can start with the seniors. And, uh, you know, so we're moving that along, moving that along. And I thank you for all the support with the school because it really is a beautiful school. Okay, questions from the RTM or the members of the public regarding the FOI and stuff? Uh, you probably need to come up and get a mic. Uh, Dennis Flanagan, RTM, 5th District. Um, my concern is on the capital side but, uh, with the economic situation we're facing in, in, in the current years, uh, uh, justifying the cost of a million dollars for central air, central air conditioning in these schools would be very difficult for the RTM probably to justify it at this time. So that, that was my big concern with the, you know, everybody likes to have central air conditioning, but is this the time to do it? Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Good evening. Greg Geraldman, um, Mr. Hernandez, Mr. Perdon, thank you for a great presentation. Um, had a couple questions um, regarding legal fees um, and legal services it is where is that reflected in the um, in the budget for 2021 um, 22 21 and 21 to 22 I may have missed it Uh, it's line item number 32. Number so, 32? Okay. okay. Uh, so and what, all right. And what page? Um, line item number 32 comes up on a couple of pages, but if you look at... Mm -hmm. It's on page 20. Yeah, you can see on page 20. Is that 20? 20. 20, thank you. Um, gentlemen, um, referring to page 36, uh, technology budget request detail. All the way down and all the way to the left, under 20 to 21 actual expenses, 1 1.931981. What page are we on? I'm sorry. Grace. Yeah, page 36. Okay. Sorry, all the way down and all the way to the left. <clears throat> One point, yeah. So does that represent what has essentially been in, in the most recent school year? That represents what's been spent with regard to technology in terms of hard costs and salaries, people? It's, it, yes and no. Okay. Uh, the uh, the, the 1.9 million is the actual expense for last school year. Yes. It's broken down into fixed costs, which in the budget book is explained, and then required costs, which is, uh, that's also explained, and then variable costs. You add up all of those, uh, those three categories, the first being uh, fixed costs, Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that's that is where you would find salaries, uh, Mr. Jerome, and you can see the number of people there. You know, that little number right below the 140,000. Um, that's a 1.0. Uh, that is the certified salary for the administrator. So if you're looking to see what that administrator made last year, that's what that administrator uh, oh, made last great. year. Great. And on the subject of salaries for administrators, Mr. Hernandez, thank you for the segue. Um, what is the salary for the combined salary 
for the chief operating officer and the assistant superintendent, please? I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Uh, okay. You can find it. I believe it's in a in the. Um, I'm trying to think if it's on a, on the website or you can certainly. Um, Put in a Freedom of Information Act, and we can certainly get that information to you. Um, I'm asking it in the context of a of a budget, Mr. Hernandez. I don't, I don't have that number off top. Of my okay. Head. <laughs> All right. Well, then I'll I'll send you a note, and you could send it back to me, and uh, ahead of the next hearing. How's that? As um, I said, you know the process. Thank you. Um, let's see. Lastly, um, Mr. Hernandez, you mentioned. Um, you mentioned and have mentioned before a savings with regard to the change in the director of athletic uh, position. Um, my understanding is that the current um, director of athletics is making somewhere in the neighborhood of 95% of $112,000. Okay, so that's, call it about 105000 my understanding is is that the combined stipend for athletic duties of the previous directors was a combined $25,000. Is that correct or incorrect? It's incorrect. Okay, could you elaborate please? Uh, I can tell you it's incorrect, Mr. Jerome. I didn't come prepared to speak to that today. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Okay, because you were you were talking about how um, there was a net saving and, and went into uh, great elaboration um, about the net savings. That is correct. So I'd like to understand that a little more. If we're talking 25000 on one side, 105000 on the other, um, it, it, you know, I'm looking for some words in between those two extremes. I'm seeing that. I'm not sure if this helps at all. Please. On that page 32, is, uh, there is a, on the fixed cost, there's a addition of 15307 There's a reduction of 27560 for uh, a total reduction of 12253 um, There's some other reductions in that budget, so that might have been what he was referring to. So that total page actually Okay. It's showing a reduction from the revised budget of 19000 So I'm sure there's a lot more detail that the Board of Ed could provide. Mm -hmm. you. That's, that's what we're Fair enough. pursuing here. That may be helpful, but it may not answer your question. Thank you, Mr. Mooney. I appreciate it. And last question, it's real quick. Um, the communications specialist, has that individual been hired? And if so, for how much in terms of salary, please? No, they weren't. They have not been hired. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. I appreciate yes, it. Sir. Okay. Um, are there other questions from the public or our team members in regards to, uh, say, the capital budget or the operating budget? Sure. Um, it's, it's more of a uh, of a comment than a question. Um, I just want to remind the board we are meeting uh, next Monday. So, um, if you want to put that capital request in. We've had some conversations um, about uh, SAC and adult ed. And so that would also be, a it may not have to happen Monday, but that's something that right. it, it would be forthcoming. And so the board has discussed um, with myself and the first selectman, uh, the prospect of uh, taking the SAC program, the accounting for it programmatically, uh, the board of ed runs it as adult ed. So it would basically be back on the uh, Board of Ed's books. Uh, years ago, it was moved to the town books. Uh, you know, in terms of the code, they would still come and present budgets, but that's something that uh, we, we had talked about. But it wasn't something that uh, you know, Jamie and myself felt we should, uh, required a, a action by, uh, by this body. So uh, if, if that's right, you know, may, maybe next Monday. If not, then. Uh, we could look yeah, at it in May, but you know, just want to put it in the context of the budget. So, absolutely, I, and I, and I think that's uh, 
if I can, Jim, I'll just give you a call and, uh, so we can just talk about the, the, the mechanics. I just want to make sure that I reference it uh, appropriately. That's all. Yeah. And, uh, so it would still be a, a fund as we see it here, it just be managed. Back a board of ed. It would, it would be, it, yeah, my understanding it would stay a separate fund, but, you know, in terms of the overall. Uh, Administration of it? Right. Yeah, I mean, we can't carry that type of fund by, by statute. We can't have that type of a fund. Right. It's, it's on our right. books. It's a buffer. Right now, the town actually does the. That's correct. <coughs> yeah. yeah, and maybe next week is too soon, but I, I didn't want to surprise anybody. No, no, I appreciate that. that this we've, was been yeah, we've, been, we've been talking about it. I mean, yeah, to kind of it, mention it. So. Simply put, I mean, school age child care is a function of the Family Resource Center and the Family Resource Grant. So, when uh, and what happened in Bramford is that school aged child care came before a family resource center. So all of that stayed on the town side uh, very appropriately. But now um, that that piece uh, where Charles and Kim just presented, we just need to figure out the mechanics of that, how we do that. And uh, that's that's really uh, Okay. Yeah, and I'm yeah. trying to take look at the calendar from June thirtieth, work back yeah. a little bit. So. Yeah. Just, and the, the other is, uh, you know, as it relates to the uh, the air conditioning, obviously there's a lot of um, moving parts. You, you mentioned a, a couple of them. One is the uh, the state landscape, you know, in terms of what the governor is looking at, and there's some pressure for more funding for indoor air quality. Um, you also had mentioned about some of the uh, uh, timing restrictions and uh, and supply shortages, etc. And uh, and this is not unique to Brantford. Uh, it's certainly not unique uh, to even uh, some of the town projects. I I'm wondering if it's if it's worth uh, to seek a uh, a legislative remedy. In other words, do we send a uh, a letter to uh, to Rosa Blumenthal and Murphy uh, and just you know advise them that while while this is a great uh, allocation. To you know, to the town of Brantford, you know, all the things that they read about in the news and certainly with, with the war in Ukraine, it's not getting any easier. Um, might there be a, a prospect for Congress to extend the deadline? Right. I know on the uh, coronavirus relief funding, uh, that, that got extended. And I know uh, as it related to certain uh, uh, COVID with FEMA, there was some extension. So. I think there's a pattern of, of legislative relief. That doesn't mean that we're going to get it, but I, I think if we're looking at uh, at tools to try to uh, put forward, I think sometimes uh, seeking a, a legislative remedy is should be on that list. So, so I'm just okay. suggesting okay. suggesting yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jim. For those Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Okay. I think we're all set. With the Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank of you. course. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Oh. Joe. So what I tried to do in the memo is uh, put forward kind of, you know, where, where, where we are uh, and then going forward. So, so again, I, I know you have it in front of you, but for the folks uh, back home or watching it on TV, uh, over the past year, you know, we discussed the regulations governing the use of ARPA funds. We talked about Brantford's entitlement of just shy of 8.3 million. We talked about the changes that occurred in January 
uh, which had that standard revenue allowance. And what was significant to Brantford is because our grant is under $10 million, uh, by choosing that allowance, we were afforded great latitude in terms of the use of our ARPA dollars. We talked about creating a separate fund to track those dollars. And the consensus uh, that I determined uh, from the board, uh, the first selectman and uh, anecdotal conversations with members of the RTM is that uh, following the, uh, the budget process or something very similar to it would be a good way of, of proceeding because it's a process that folks are familiar with and it's also a process that's done in public and it's a process in which needs uh, of departments and sometimes outside agencies are requested. So in summary, um, the request total approximately 2.6 million, or about a third of, uh, of what's been allocated for ARPA. Uh, we didn't want to go full speed ahead. We wanted to sort of get our, our legs under us, under us on this. Uh, an acquaintance of, of mine who used to own a variety of restaurants would refer to this as a soft opening. And then you work things out, the kitchen, the wait staff, et cetera, then you have your real opening down the road. So. Uh, Again, it may, may be a weak analogy since I'm not in that business, but I, 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 it was going through my mind as, uh, as I was writing this. And, um, and we wanted to span uh, various uh, operations within the government. And you know, if you look at an audit report, you can see how expenditures are broken down by function, general government, public safety, public works, human services and recreation. Uh, some of the uh, items and functions that aren't in there, pensions and debt service, not eligible. Board of Education, uh, as, as you saw tonight, they have their own dollars. So we have, uh, uh, with Catherine's assistance, we put together the uh, spreadsheets on the back. Uh, that's, that's the benefit of, ha of having a good assistant when you're out for a couple of days. And, uh, but I wanted to hit sort of the way to look at this. You know, this is our sort of our maiden voyage here. So how, how, how do we look at this? How do we put this in context? So the first is, all, everything on this list was previously not working. All, all, all of the things on the list were previously presented to the board. So there's no one here tonight presenting a project because these are things that have already been presented. Um, you know, some of the recommendations reflect an increase over the amount request. So, you know, we're looking at, at this as an opportunity to even do more uh, in certain areas. Uh, that said, you know, uh, there may be a temptation to basically take things that we used to fund with taxes and not fund them with taxes and backfill it with ARPA dollars, which, as I read it, would be supplanting, uh, which would be permissible. However, there are opportunities where the use of ARPA dollars uh, can uh, result result in a reduction of a request without triggering a supplanting violations. And that's something uh, to kind of consider when you're trying to look programmatically at the general fund budget, the capital budget, and ARPA, so you kind of, and when, when you look at all of those. Uh, and then there are, there are some areas which we would want to continue uh, after ARPA funds go away. And I think, Joe, you mentioned that. And, uh, your discussions with the superintendent upon, uh, you know, how do you deal with certain cliffs? And so you could deal with a cliff a couple different ways. Um, and, but the one that uh, would most likely be used is that in the next couple years, the general fund budget would actually be adjusted to kind of get there. So, so for example, if you had a, uh, a, uh, a project that was 150,000, you may go 150, zero, and then you may go, you know, for 150, then you might go the other way up, you might go zero, 50, 100, then 150. So that, that kind of gives you an example of, of how we might use that where there might be some glide path. There's other, there's other areas where they'd be one time. You know, we're actually uh, basically doing something. We don't plan to do it for a while. Uh, there's some that are a little bit of both where we're actually saying, okay, we could augment existing services here, uh, and if it's if it's an item such as road paving, for example, 
you, you know, uh, delays result in a degradation. So uh, if you can try to get ahead of that, uh, some of that's reflected in there. Also, uh, in an area where you might have a sinking fund, you know, you take one of those purchases and you use ARPA. So now you're sinking, so you didn't actually uh, supplant anything because you'd still be funding your sinking fund at the same level. But you've also actually made the sinking fund stronger and uh, that one-time purchase may help offset some of the uh, inflationary pressures uh, going forward. Again, the, the, the next uh, piece of this uh, would be integrating this, uh, like I said, programmatically with the operating and capital budgets. The other thing that's uh, in following the budget process, which I want to underscore, is in past years at the March meeting, we've done transfers uh, to uh, reflect or, or incorporate elements of the, uh, the request. Uh, I think you could look at ARPA the same way. Um, and when we typically do that, we're actually increasing the current year's budget. ARPA funds are available now, so doing a piece of that in the current year, to the extent that it, uh, timing considerations make that warranted, I think that's something you can consider. Again, that is re reflective of the budget process because that is our process to amend a budget. And when I say, what is that process again? You know, request for the finance recommendation to the RTM, RTM approval. So uh, we follow that that uh, that same process. And uh, so that's that's kind of what we're looking at. We, we know that uh, since this process began, uh, we've been approached by other other organizations and some of their needs, uh, but, but we didn't feel that those were ripe to present right now. Uh, but they may be, you know, in the near future. Uh, but again, sticking to our guidance of not asking for anything through ARPA that wasn't already presented to you, uh, that would again be an example of, of possibly amending uh, a future budget or amending a current year budget. So requests would then come to this body. So you might be appropriating ARPA dollars throughout the year following that process. Uh, and I know, and I've acknowledged it here, that historically, uh, when folks have done that in the past, the, the question has always been, well, you know, why didn't you ask for this in the budget process? Because uh, in setting your mill rate, you want to know what all those requests are. Essentially, you're taking your requests, and then you're adjusting those requests. And that whole process is it so that you could set a mill rate in May, and so that we can send tax bills out in July. So in that case, the expenditure requests, less the adjustments, drive the revenue. Uh, I think it, this, yeah. this approach is, is, is different because it's the reverse sequence. The revenue is known, and you're working back to the request. So it's, so it's a little bit different. So uh, I think that's about it. I mean, uh, so um, for example here, uh, the paving of a million dollars, that would be efficient. Yes. Whereas the, uh, the new CPR device that was a request, a new request, so there's not an issue of supplant. And so that's kind of the concept versus the, uh, when you talk about the ambulance purchase, the, the concept would be in order to avoid supplantation, you'd actually buy it out of this ARPA funds, but you'd still fund the saving fund. That way, you're not, it's not a supplanting issue. So it's a little finesse in the way it funds, I think James put this together, but the process was to follow a similar process we used for other authorizations for expenditures, which is got the control of the uh, your recommendation from the administration or the department that comes to where the finance goes to the RCM. Uh, I think mean, that's part of the fact that it's, uh, that process has worked. Charlie? I was going to ask you, Joe. Well, like in your the comment about paving a million bucks, couldn't the argument be on the other side? Well, you can spend what you normally sp so you're taking money that you would usually spend anyway. No, you're actually adding to it in this case. Yeah, but is there a definite amount when you add every year? In the budget, there's a budget.
request. Oh, I see. So you're going yeah. by this year's so budget only. Right. You have to compare it to a supplant. Hey, yeah, but what about next year? Because you could well, add up the budget for next year. Well, the next year, you'd still have to look at the budget to say what's the what's the allocation of the budget. That's that's kind of the measure. Okay, so that's going to be the guide, right? So you to add to extent, it. Yeah. No, I'm trying to just sure. sort of defend yeah. what you're saying. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, that the concept is, is that if it's the requester in the budget, you wouldn't say, well, I'm going to reduce the, yep. that and, and then put it here. That would be a supplanting. You'd say, all right, if there's, a, historically we've had 50, 500,000 or whatever that number is, that's, that's either. We're not asking to have the, I think it is 500,000, right? Yeah. 500,000 for this is the request in the budget. Um, that you heard the other night. We're not asking to adjust that, we're asking to continue to fund that, and we're also asking to add in, uh, by another million out of the ARPA. As Jim mentioned, we're looking at, you know, there's, uh, we think, you know, putting a, some dollars in there will help address it now, uh, yeah. the conditions of the roads so that would face you know, further degradation while waiting. Next year, the request will still you know, we'll probably be, typically we ask for, we're trying to increase it, I think, is last couple of years by 50,000, 25 to 50,000 per year. So next year's request would still be in the budget um, as it has historically, probably with a slight increase. Um, so there's no supplanting. This is just additional shot of uh, dollars in that, that program uh, to address some of the paving needs throughout town. Yeah, I saw the show over here. That certainly is appropriate for you. Because we never have one. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, that would be an example. Of, yeah. Okay. Um, other questions on this concept that Jim is presenting with regards to the ARPA funds? Questions from RTM members and members of the public? No papers. Okay. Anything else that we need to talk about with regards to this at this point? No, I, I think, you know, it, as Jim did a great job in laying it out, and I think the board can expect in some upcoming meetings that we will come forward with, uh, there has been some uh, organizations that have reached out and inquired about uh, potential funding, and we'll bring that, we'll bring the, uh, uh, on your agenda and have uh, presentations made for each, each uh, request. Thanks, Jim. Okay. So, I will entertain a motion to uh, close the public hearing for the Town of Brantford 22-23 budget process. So moved. Moved by Victor. Second. Second by Harry. Discussion, comments? All in favor? Uh, and aye. And that, and with no other business to come before the board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. This program was brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings and other videos on demand at BrantfordTV.org.